Okay, let's do the introductions. Uh, agenda first, and then we'll cover it. Um, we're going to cover uh, what Pac-12 Networks is, because I'm sure a lot of you, raise your hand if you're familiar with what Pac-12 Networks is. Oh, good. Oh, that's, that's great. Wow. Oh, sorry. Good. Oh, I see that's an Arizona State video you had up there, but I'll, I have some duck stuff, too. Um, we'll cover the unique challenges that a media content creator uh, faces um, with regards to archiving, uh, and why a traditional model versus something new had to be discussed. Um, we'll cover budget planning, uh, the stand-up, Martin, uh, is with SwissTech, um, and we'll do introductions in a second, but he helped me stand it up. And then uh, what happens when it all inevitably goes wrong? I have a great story for that one. Uh, how one-click expansions are probably not the way to expand your cluster. Uh, and the takeaways and lessons we learned after having SwiftStack for almost two years now. So my name is Scott Adamitz. I'm the Director of System Architecture and Technology at Pac-12 Networks in San Francisco. In my former life, I uh, helped launch Big Ten Network in Chicago. And in the middle, I worked at Groupon uh, during their IPO phase. So that was exciting. Hand and I'm Martin. Martin Lanner. I'm with SwissTech. I'm an engagement manager. And I do exactly what Scott just described, which is uh, help our customers stand up their clusters, uh, engineer their environments so that they are well um, done and can expand in the future. And Martin had worked with us very uh, from the very beginning all the way to today. We still have problems that we're dealing with, and he's helping me solve my issues that I cause. So let's cover uh, what Pac-12 Networks is. Um, this is one of those short little propaganda films that I'm supposed to play. Um, I like it. It gives me the tingles. So see if it does for you. So as you can tell, it did launch in August of 2012. Uh, I'll give you some stats on the network itself. Um, it's made up of the 12 most prestigious universities in the world, in my opinion. Uh, we've won 469 NCAA championship titles, which is more than any other conference by about 200. So it's a very, it's the winningest conference in US college collegiate sports. Uh, we are available as a network in 60 million US homes and an additional 33 countries through a YouTube distribution deal internationally. Uh, we produce 850 live events every year. Uh, and I can't tell you how much content that is. Uh, uh, we were actually founded uh, through a 12-year, $3 billion deal with Fox and ESPN. Uh, that was the genesis of our network. So let's talk about the challenges. Uh, this is the number that keeps me up at night, uh, ratio, that is. Uh, for every one hour of live content, we store and record eight hours of media. And how you're asking, could that be possible? It's one game. It's three hours long. It should be three hours of media. No, there's front halls, back halls. There's B-roll of I coaches' interviews. There's uh, content that they use to make packages, promos, and features. Uh, they'll do cutdowns of the game because people don't want to watch a three-hour long game. They want to watch it in 60 minutes. So we'll take all the action, put it together into a shorter uh, clip. That's a new piece of media that has to be stored. So this is a challenge that we face every day. And unfortunately, we underestimated what we'd need when we first launched the network back in 2012. This is what we, uh, our launch SAN, uh, we had two tiers. One tier was 15,000K SAS drives, about 100 terabytes usable. Uh, tier two was 200 terabytes of slower SATA disks. And the idea was we'd have 3,000 hours available for recording, editing, and playback. And then once it's not needed, in other words, football season's over, we'll go to basketball. Uh, because those are two different seasons and they don't overlap at all. Uh, hint, they do. And so what we found out is we filled up our tier two because we kept punting content to it. Uh, and had no place to go from there. So uh, some stats on how we ingest. Um, on a busy weekend between football and basketball seasons, as we are in right now, we'll ingest about 12 terabytes of archivable media uh, each weekend. So it's, it's not small. 
The reality of this model lasted six months before we figured out we needed something else. Um, and this is where uh, we looked at traditional archive strategies. We could expand our tier two, add more disks. We had enough in the chassis to pretty much double it. Um, problem was that was going to be about $1,600 per terabyte to expand. Um, yes, it's always online and it's extremely fast, but it's a sand, it doesn't scale. Um, and it's not meant for archive. So it should never have been an archive in the first place. So that obviously doesn't work. Um, what next? This would be what everyone's thinking, LTL. Uh, and I talked to a lot of people, in, including a very high level person at Turner Sports, uh, who shall remain unnamed. Uh, <laughs> and I asked them when we were in the planning phase, would you go LTO today? If you were building a greenfield network, would you go LTO? And he said emphatically, yes, absolutely. Tape is never going away. Yes, it's cheap, and you can restore locally, but unless you make a copy of it, it's not safe. And unless you have a body that's going to load the tape robot when it inevitably runs out of slots, and you start to have to put things on a shelf, um, it gets quite expensive. Um, not to mention, I just hate it. It's rust on tape. We're 2014, uh, at the time 2012, we can do better. So we decided to look for something else, and you know, the next obvious answer is to the cloud. We'll just go to the cloud. Oh yeah, I wanted to burn LTO tape, so it's gone. I really don't like tape. Uh, so the option was, let's try Amazon. Um, we're close to a data center that's affordable at the Oregon data center. Uh, but there's, there's, there's benefits here, obviously. It's durable, uh, 11 nines for both S3 and Glacier, which makes me think they're the same thing. Um, it's geographically diverse, and it scales infinitely. Uh, but there's a problem. S3 is way too expensive to store my long-term archive. I did the math uh, for this presentation. If I were to move my archive to S3 today, my first month's bill would be $217,000. That's one month. So logically, you say Glacier. It's one cent per gig per month, and they keep on lowering the price. Um, it doesn't work. It's too slow. I need my content back uh, fast, and I need my content back often. This is not a... Uh, a uh, a, what's the term? Uh, web banking, where we have to push it off and keep it for 10 years, a regulatory backup. This is not regulatory backup. We push this off so we leave room on our tier one so we can bring in new content. And then once we need it, like let's say we are in, in summer and we're about to go into football season again, the producers will want to bring back all of last year's football games. So I, I can't pay that amount um, coming back from Glacier. It would be too expensive. So those don't work. So this led me to find something new. Uh, these were at the time I started looking, my requirements. And you'll notice there's two extra boxes because uh, it evolved. I need it to be durable, I need it to be scalable, has to be fast and has to be affordable. And as you can see, none of the options that we just talked about really cover it. For LTO to be uh, um, durable, I need to make two copies and now it's no longer affordable. So take one check and move it from the bottom to the top. For S3 and Glacier, yes, they're durable and scalable, but one's fast and one's slow. Uh, or one's fast and one's affordable. So. Object, this is where, we, where, I, where I started. Um, object kind of solves all this, doesn't it? Uh, the problem is that not all object is the same. So these are all companies that claim to have object storage. Uh, and we did not want to get locked into a vendor, and I didn't want to buy their hardware, because this needed to be affordable. So uh, not object, I need, it to be, I, need, I need whatever I'm gonna put in to be open. Um, and, and yeah, so something open. And obviously, Swift. And this is actually where we started with our archive. I spun up my own Swift cluster native um, before the Swift Tech guys got involved. And uh, it worked, it was wonderful. I, was, uh, I saw the light, I was an early adopter. Um, this was back in the Essex Folsom days, I think. So mm -hmm. not, not the earliest, but earliest to put it in production. But there's a problem here. Um, what happens if I leave? Um, Dana wants me to say this. I, uh, the team that we manage is a team of four. Um, we've launched this network with even fewer, and we've brought on more people as we go. Um, the systems team is four people, myself included. So I can't have something that isn't supportable if I end up leaving or something terrible happens to me. So I need this to be enterprise grade with support and SLAs. So obviously Swift and Swift Stack uh, in particular uh, became the option. So I was going to jump into it now and show you what we built. And uh, I'll tell you before we start, it's working wonderfully. Um, we built two tiers, um, which is unique. I, I think people thought we were just gonna build one and put a local object store. That doesn't satisfy all the requirements. I still need a DR location, 
and I still need uh, the ability to scale infinitely. And I don't really want to scale my local cloud infinitely. I'd love to be able to have a, a specific amount in there. So what we decided was two to three years of cached media content stored locally in my data center. Um, it's fast. It's a right click, actually, um, to bring it back into my system, uh, into my media asset management system. It scales unbelievably easy with one click, and I'll explain why you don't want to do that. Uh, and it's inexpensive. Um, the Swift stack was wonderful. They brought in uh, uh, hardware guides and said, this is what we'd recommend. And I took that and um, kind of added my own little special sauce to it. And we uh, beefed it up a bit and made it fit in the budget. Uh, and then the greatest part is that it integrates natively with, or not natively, it integrates with my legacy man application, which happens to be this uh, software called Dillette. So tier four is also involved. And this is why I had to do this. I needed a DR location. And because I was already an object, and because I was already going to have a workflow that copied it to a SIPS gateway, I figured, why can't I then fork that media to both my local cloud and my public cloud? Um, so by doing that, I actually was able to meet a monetization partner who takes our content. Um, as you guys love, it's a bunch of Ducks fans in here. Um, people want that content, and we're the owners of it. Pac-12 Conference and Pac-12 Networks owns it. So we found a uh, third party that we've used before that actually licenses that content and then pays us a dividend of it. So we meet them in S3. They're already there with their transcode farm and their uh, catalog. So we give them access to our S3 bucket, read only, for seven days, and they're able to pull as much as they want. After that, it automatically ages into Glacier, and I'll explain that uh, as we go. So this is how my media workflow um, is today. Uh, well actually, is it's similar. I'll tell you the story. Um, that green arrow is that onslaught of media, the 12 terabytes a weekend that keeps coming in. It lands on tier one, which is very fast. And then from there, uh, I needed a way to get it to both my private cloud and public cloud. And I'll throw it over to Martin to explain where SwiftStack came in and solved that piece for me. Yes, yeah, so, um, so like Scott alluded to earlier, we um, brought up the, um, the SwiftStack cluster in there. And um, there are two uh, file system gateways. Um, where the Dillette software can uh, send the data to one gateway or the other. And what happens is that, um, correct me if I'm wrong mm -hmm. here now, but. Um, no, and it's evolved. Yeah, so, so some of the, the data that Scott mentioned goes up to the cloud where they can be met by their partner, and all the other data also goes into the private store, which is sitting on premise in a incredibly beautiful data center. Yeah, well we have pictures I'll show you and then you'll talk about actually the, yeah. the physical specs of it. And the power in this is that I keep it local, I can push content to it, but I can delete from tier three if I need to. We never delete from tier four. Tier four is our posterity archive. It's the achievements and accomplishments of Pac-12 athletes for the next hundred years. Um, and when we started Pac-12, that was one thing we were missing. There was no archive. Um, it, was a, it was a big challenge. Uh, when I launched Big Ten Network back in 2007, they had a huge archive. I mean, it was warehouses full of uh, everything from reel-to-reel -reel tape to film to nitrate. I mean, th there was so much content going back that we didn't know what to do with it all. Pac-12, unfortunately, didn't have that because they grew in a different way. So that was why we wanted an archive, first of all, and why it had to last forever. And this is why Tier 3 and Tier 4 made sense. So physically, let's look at the SwiftStack cluster that we have in San Francisco. Um, uh, actually, Martin, you cover the specs on this because you were the one that told me to build it. Yeah. Okay. So uh, yeah. So it's um, to begin with, it was about uh, 1.1 petabytes raw and uh, roughly 360, 350 terabyte usable, meaning uh, one copy is the usable uh, portion of it. Uh, so that then translates into three replicas, and um, every object is the max file size or object size is about five gigs. So in some cases, uh, the large video files gets chunked up and gets placed as uh, um, several different objects in there that gets uh, put together as a manifest. Um, so based on the um, model of as unique as possible that Swift uses, um, we designed it together with Scott to create five zones, uh, meaning that every zone will have, um, for not every zone, but every object will be placed in three different zones. So if one zone, which in this case happens to sit with a topper rack switch uh, and have different power supplies, if one zone goes away, 
there's still durability of the data and accessibility. Um, so you're looking at three of our zones right there, and there's another right. two behind it that you aren't seeing. Um, the, the first rack has all of the management controllers, the proxy nodes, and the uh, file system gateways. Uh, and then you see the big honking 4RU drive chassis. Those are our object storage targets, and there's 10 of them. Um, and it, it, you know, it, it was a great model for us um, when we first started because Martin uh, explained that our expansion is very easy in Swift Stack, but you have to plan for it ahead of time. And so if you notice, there's space underneath every one of those racks, or every one of those uh, big servers. We always put a blanking panel because we want it to look pretty, but below that is 4RU of space. And if you look at the bottom, we have the same thing. So there's an additional 10 uh, 4RU bays completely empty, ready, and we uh, predicted the power usage for them um, before we ever got to phase two. So let's talk about why uh, this uh, model ended up working out for the best. Uh, I'll never forget the day. It was uh, October 28th, 2013. Actually, all of you were probably in Hong Kong. In fact, I know you were in Hong Kong because you got the email while you were in Hong Kong. I was not. I was in San Francisco getting a phone call at 5.13 a.m. Um, our tier two exploded. It uh, lost a storage controller. Uh, it didn't beep, it didn't have a red light, it didn't send an, a trap, it, it just went stupid, um, which put us to half speed and no, no parity. Um, and this is a DDN, if anyone has a DDN or wants one, we have one to give away. Um, we replaced it. But we, we basically figured out that uh, we, <laughs> Monday, this was a Monday, uh, one of our controllers failed of two. So DDN shipped us out a replacement controller the next day, because that's the next business day. So on Wednesday, we actually received it. We put it in, racked it up, it was broken. Uh, they shipped us a faulty one. So Thursday, they ship out a second replacement controller. Friday it arrives, and by the time uh, we racked it up, installed it, and brought it up, we, it, it worked this time. Um, we lost one bit in our tier two. So the entire, uh, entire volume was corrupted. It would have taken weeks to go through because there was no journaling because you have to have journaling across two controllers. So with having only one controller, the journal was not being written, so we couldn't restore from journal. So uh, because of that, this is up in our data center and will be for the rest of time. If you can't see it, let me make it a little bigger. Um, this actually got back to the company and they were not too pleased about this, but we lost uh, 174 terabytes of media. Or did we? Uh, we had finished our copy to Swift Stack a couple days prior. So we really didn't lose anything. Uh, we were able to restore from SwiftStack uh, in, a, in a matter of days. It was beautiful. It, it, we weren't freaking out. We made them stress, but we weren't freaking out. So it works. Um, the archives already come into, and it's paid for itself, and it's wonderful, and we're very happy, and thank you very much, and I'll hug you after this. So let's talk phase two. Um, immediately after that, we decided we need to expand this because it works and it's easy and it, it fits into our workflow just great. So let's put more in. So this past summer, um, with Martin's assistance, uh, we uh, more than doubled it. Yeah. Yeah, so um, like Scott told you, the, the blank panels on there, they, are, uh, they were there for a reason. He had already planned this to begin with. There's an extra HBA in, um, in the the storage nodes so that it would be really easy to just buy another JBOD, plug it in on the back side. And uh, these particular JBODs uh, have 45 slots in them. So at, at, at this time, there's 80 disks behind, or 81 to be exact, but uh, behind every object uh, node. So uh, that, when we were done, had it in, uh, injected all, that, all of it. Uh, ended up being uh, 1.3 uh, petabytes. Uh, additional raw. Yeah, yeah. Additional raw. Um, and these connected with two cables, um, and power, obviously, but uh, two mini SAS cables. Uh, I mean, it was the easiest that I've ever done. We just, they were heavy. I mean, these things are hard to move, but they shipped with drives in them. But once we got them racked up, um, it, it was very easy. And now let's talk about how not to expand your archive. Um, this is a pro tip for anyone out there. Uh, when you're adding 450, brand new, completely empty, 3 terabyte drives, and your cluster is 98% full already, which I didn't know, um, uh, click the orange Add Gradually button. Um, that will do it. it will it's a well, measured, slow, methodical process. It will usually take a few weeks, especially at the size, but it works, and it doesn't take away the, uh, any of the processing power from incoming requests or anything like that. 
Uh, so I like to live dangerously, and I clicked the big red button that said add it all now. So, uh, and let me show you what that does. Um, it worked, by the way. It worked amazingly. Um, this is a uh, Nagios networking graph from one of the nodes. So just realize that there are 10 other ones. Um, this is immediately before I click the button. And uh, if you can note the scale, it's uh, 200 um, megabytes per second. We're not in bits, we're in bytes. Um, this is immediately after I click the button. Um, notice the scale has now jumped to 600 megabytes per second, and this is on one node. Uh, again, there are 10. So if you look at that number, we were pushing uh, close to 5 gigabytes per second throughout the cluster, uh, moving it from disks that were completely full to disks that were completely empty. And this took um, several days, if you can notice. That's, those are in days. So when all, most of Wednesday night, all of Thursday, all of Friday, and then we, we actually throttled it because we realized we couldn't restore. Uh, <laughs> so we turned it down a little bit. Um, so let's talk numbers so you guys can see that this does work um, with the budget guys and the CFO. Um, in phase one, uh, we added about 1.1 uh, terabytes. Phase two, we added 1350. And if you look at the cost per terabyte, if you remember that first slide early on when I said that to expand our tier two would be about $1,600 per terabyte, just to go from 200 to 415. Um, I'm, I'm a quarter of that. And that was with phase one. And as I added more and more drives and using JBODs and planning ahead with a beefed up CPU, a bigger SAS backplane, um, I'm able to get it down to about $361 uh, per terabyte. So the takeaways, and this is where we open it up for questions, because I think there's a lot um, here that we can talk about. Uh, this technology is stable. Um, as long as you don't click that big red button, uh, it works great, and we're very happy with it. It saved our butts at least once, and I don't doubt that it will save us again. Um, and I do, I will say that the, the biggest caveat, or the biggest takeaway I would say is look for opportunities that object brings. Um, we would never have been able to meet our archive provider, our monetization partner, in, the, uh, in Amazon Web Services if we didn't have a reason to push it to Glacier. So I could just put it in Glacier, but I can't let them touch it because it would cost them so much to be able to pull it back. So that was just something that just the, the light bulb went off and it's worked perfectly. Um, they pull all of our content and we've been licensing like crazy. So, uh, and then plan ahead. Um, trust these guys. They know what they're doing. They walked us through every step of the way, and we planned for a future expansion before we'd even put in the first phase. So, thank you guys. And there's our info if you guys want to get in touch. Um, yeah, questions? So, 4K is either here or coming. Which is the bigger network, and what impact is it having? 4K is easy. Uh, 8K is, is actually um, the harder one. Um, so, what we do is, um, it's a great way to say this. Instant replays, if you guys have seen sports. Um, you always want to be able to see it from every angle, and you want to be able to, to zoom in on the play. Was his, was his knee down? Did, uh, did, was he out at the base? Um, 2K, which is what we have right now, doesn't really help you do that, because you zoom in, and it looks like web quality from old cell phone days. It's really bad. For, uh, 4K helps. 4K gives you a wider field of view, and you can leave the camera uh, fixed, and then zoom into it. Um, but 8K is where it's really at, because now you can take an 8K camera, and they exist, I've played with them, they're amazing, um, and take a shot of the entire baseball diamond and never move the camera. And then you just move a virtual window within the 8K image, and you can get down to just 2K native. So you can go down to 1080p in, a four, in, a, in, in an 8K image. And the, the, and now the little demo I always do is take four credit cards and put them uh, in a little grid, a little rectangle, and then take a, a fifth credit card that's like moving a virtual camera within a bigger image. So what you used to be able to only see with one, you can now see with four. And then with eight, double it again. <laughs> and now you're getting 16. I mean, now I can't do math. I'm an engineer. Uh, <laughs> it's, 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 that's the hardest part for us. And we have to record that constantly. So yes, it's here. It's coming. Um, our tier one SAN, as you saw, again, if anyone needs a, a DDN SAN, if you can get it, if you can come take it, it's yours. Um, we replaced it with an EMC VNX2, uh, about a petabyte and we are planned uh, for 8K at this moment, so. Uh, so how does the uh, gateway sort of split it and it's sort of like splitting the signal, right? So can you talk a little bit more about? It would have done that. It would have done that. So uh, that was my goal. I wanted to be able to have one gateway, copy the file once, and um, then let it send it to two different uh, object storage locations. Um, and. Oddly enough, uh, the technology was possible. I, we had actually had custom development done for Maldivica, um, which I think you guys acquired some of the IP for that. Um, that was planned to have, to have it work. 
Uh, now, the wrench comes in with our media asset management system uh, called Dillette. Um, Dillette is not capable of saying, if I put you in one place, I'll consider you in two places. Dillette has to physically move the file once and then say, okay, it's online on tier three. And now I'm going to copy another file. Well, it's online on tier four. So we were actually limited by the Dillette installation uh, and the Dillette capabilities. We had to do f two physical copies. Um, luckily, we had the bandwidth to do it. I mean, it doesn't really slow us down that much. So we bought two gateways instead. One goes to tier three, one goes to tier four. In order for Dillette to understand, yes, this media is online and healthy in tier three and tier four. Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, we think alike. <laughs> No, no, no. We're, uh, so that's a great part about Pac-12 is we are 100% uh, owned and operated by the Pac-12 conference, uh, which is not for profit. So we are we do not have a broadcast partner. So everything you see that we've done, um, we we built the network in five months by ourselves. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah. I mean, we share content with them. Um, yes, and I and lots of friends there, and it's a great place. Um, they are owned 50% by Fox. So that was, I, I got to see it one way and now I get to see it another. And if you look at the third option, the SEC network is 100% owned by e, uh, ESPN. So half and half, wholly owned or um, kind of like a wholly owned but by a broadcast partner. Oh yeah, oh yeah. <laughs> that was ESPN, right? That was 100%. Uh, hey Dana. Uh, what are you guys planning to do next? Okay, I knew that was gonna come. Uh, we are in the middle of a very big push into China. Um, and I was not aware of this until I started at Pac-12. Um, there aren't professional sports in China. Uh, they all are follow collegiate sports. And most of the collegiate sports they follow are on the West Coast. Um, there are actually 32 UCLA stores, official UCLA stores in mainland China. So you can walk up and there's a Gap and a you know, Banana Republic and then a UCLA store. And you can buy apparel and you, yeah, no joke. Um, I've seen pictures. Um, so with that, with knowing that we have a huge fan base there uh, and we end up bringing a lot of their students here to attend Pac-12 universities, um, it's our goal and our mission, uh, Larry Scott's goal, to push our content into China as much as we can and as fast as possible. Um, so what we're looking at now is the possibility of having another location, another region of our uh, Swift stack that is based in mainland China or as near as possible. Um, this would be able, this would be great for us to be able to stage content there and then use it in place instead of having to make the long journey back and forth. Um, uh, we are live streaming or will be live streaming to China, um, uh, at least one of our networks uh, by the end of the month, um, which is actually extremely difficult to do. And we are delivering VOD assets to China, video on demand. Um, they have a over the top cable system that is amazing. I wish we had it here, um, but we have to get content to them and it's, it's not easy. Oh, there's that great firewall and it does exist and it does make things hard. So that's our next plan, is expand this and put it in another location. On, on your last slide with cost, it looked like the CapEx for the Swift is about what you'd be paying OpEx for the uh, S3 and the, the Glacier. So any thoughts about getting rid of S3 and Glacier and like you said, building other regions, now you've got a replica and then giving your provider access into that. Absolutely. Yeah, that's that's the plan. When we launched, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, we didn't have the uh, concept of regions. Okay. So we were a, what was that? Yeah, that's correct. So that just gives you a lot of extra Oh, no, I, I agree. I completely agree. Um, and what we can do is we have 12 universities. They have data centers that are unbelievable. Um, and we have access to them. We can partner with them and we can put it into a, in fact, all of our equipment that we use for our, our digital transmission is all in university-owned and operated data centers. So, yeah, we could buy rack space. We could stand up another one down at, I mean, pick, pick a school. You want to do that tomorrow? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Let me go find some data space and <laughs> some money. But yeah, no, I think it would, it's, it, it makes a lot more sense, especially when you look at how much S3 would be, if I were to put it there, um, $217,000 a month. I barely spent 300 and I have a, a, almost three petabytes. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. And we are currently in Glacier um, uh, under management of s about seven petabytes of content. So it just keeps growing. In, in time, yeah, in time, I think it'd be smart for us to have our own infrastructure. Yes, as long as I can again meet my provider there as well. So. Um, 
We, yes and no. Uh, our, our, we're we're kind of hamstrung because our media asset management system, which if anyone's coming from broadcast, you know that it's the glue that holds all of your pieces together. It triggers records, it helps you edit, and it plays out the content. Um, it, it's the lifeblood. You, it, you can't not touch it in any, any of your workflows. Um, ours, unfortunately, doesn't speak Swift native. Uh, we've asked, we've inquired. Um, unfortunately, it doesn't sound like that's going to be something that is going to happen anytime soon or without a massive spend. Um, so knowing that, that we, we have to use these SIFS gateways and we've got to find a way to dumb it down to the least common denominator for our media asset management system, um, I can't throw more workloads at it just yet. Um, but what I'm building essentially is a vault. I'm building a vault of Pac-12 content that there's an API for. So if I want to at any point uh, tomorrow and say, hey, digital team, let's do a Pac-12 vault. Let's let everybody watch content, um, all the Pac-12 things going back to 19... 15 when we were founded um, as the uh, Western West Coast Conference, Western Athletic Conference. Um, yeah, we could do it. Um, the, the, again, the other one is we don't have archives. We didn't have it when we started. No one saved them. Or what we have is piecemeal. So there really isn't that. I don't have the content yet. I have the dream and the vision, but I don't have the content yet. But I couldn't. I have pictures. That's one of our production trucks um, that we use to produce our events. That rack of servers right there on the left is Dillette, um, so Hiss. Uh, and then that's our football or our basketball championship game that we hold every year at MGM Grand in Las Vegas. You guys are all invited. Um, we fill that thing up, and it's a beautiful, beautiful event. It's really fun. Uh, this year, actually, we'll be doing our football champ game at Levi Stadium in San Francisco, in Santa Clara. So if anybody's available in the Bay Area, please. Um, Contact me, we'll get you down there. And I have actual numbers and specs, um, and there's a workshop that I want to tell you guys about. Yeah, tomorrow morning, uh, starting at 9, uh, we'll be doing a Time Warner cable uh, kind of uh, use case, uh, and then followed up for the rest of the day uh, by a full on Swift. Swift Stack workshop on how to deploy things, what to think about when you deploy it, um, why you should be thinking about all the things that we just talked about, networking, load balancing, things like that. Um, and we'll walk you through a lot of nitty-gritty details, and Caleb, who sits there in the audience, will be leading it. Yay. Okay. Thank you, guys.